Hi, my name is Carolyn Van Dyken, and the presentation I'm going to do right now is on central sensitization and profiling a sensitive nervous system. I like to call this N equals 1 because every patient is individual and the characteristics of their sensitive nervous system are individual. So let's explore that. First of all, I have no um, conflict of interest to declare. Secondly, I would love to thank Sue Croft and the organizing committee for inviting me to come and speak. And I'd like to thank Rosa for her administrative assistance, which has been excellent in coordinating this from the other side of the world. And I would like to acknowledge the friendships and the collegial relationships that I've developed with Sean and Trish and Judith in working on bringing a biopsychosocial uh, framework to physiotherapists um, internationally. So I am a Canadian. I am a registered physiotherapist who graduated 33 years ago from McMaster University. My history is very much a Musk history. I, I'm McKenzie credentialed in 1999, and I have that has influenced my clinical practice significantly um, over the last three decades. I became a public health therapist about 20 years ago, and I was introduced to pain science um, about 12 years ago. And it's through the progressions of each of these pieces of my, of my career development that I really have developed a, um, a love for everything biopsychosocial. I've actually done a fair bit of research at this point for a clinician. I am very much a clinician. I have a bachelor's degree. I um, have written some position papers on central pain mechanisms in pelvic health, as well as done some research specifically looking at low back pain and pelvic health and how they correlate. And we'll talk about that um, on another talk a little bit later um, in this conference. I've also published um, a couple of chapters in textbooks on central sensitization, on pelvic health, and on the connection between pelvic health and orthopedics. So let's talk about pain. So the definition of pain has been recently updated by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And what I'd like to highlight in the definition of pain is that it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So I highlight the word and instead of or because it's always sensory and it's always emotional. So if that's true, then as clinicians, we need to understand and look at both the sensory and the emotional components of pain, and we need to assess both components. And I would say that certainly as physiotherapists and, and even um, probably physicians and, and nurses, we tend to focus more on the physical component of pain and a little less on the emotional component of pain. The new definition adds in that it can resemble actual or potential tissue damage. So again, there can be no tissue damage at all. It can just resemble tissue damage and it can produce pain. So that just really cues us that we have to stop looking so hard for um, pot potential tissue involvement, that we need to just take a broader perspective right from the beginning. And an example of this is an ice cream headache. An ice cream headache um, really has no tissue damage involved, and yet the, the intensity of the headache is can be quite surreal. And so we have to stop looking at um, pain being an indicator of tissue damage. On the other side of the scale is the Bethany Hamilton story that some of you may know. She was a surfer in 2003 that um, uh, had her arm bit off by a shark while she was surfing. She was on on track that year to be the junior national champion in the United States for, uh, for surfing. And she'll say to this day that all she felt was jiggle, jiggle, bump, right? Her brain in an instant flooded her system with endorphins to help her survive. She had to swim into shore. She was bleeding out. And so the only way to do that would be for her brain to kind of take over um, that pain control mechanism for her. So pain is complicated and we have to really take that um, from a background perspective at all times. Now, what is central sensitization? So we're gonna talk a little bit about a sensitive nervous system or central sensitization, and it's defined as the amplification of nerve signals within the central nervous system, which elicits pain hypersensitivity. It happens technically in the spinal cord, in the dorsal horn, and central pain mechanisms are the broader changes that also happen within the pain neuromatrix structures. And Clemens Group and many others have now demonstrated in pelvic pain that there are a lot of structural and functional brain changes that happen in persistent pain as well. 
So how do we tell if someone is centrally sensitized? So the first thing that we can do is really listen carefully to their story. And when we hear signs of disproportionate pain, especially pain that has a non-mechanical basis to it, and we um, are able to demonstrate hypersensitivity to touch or allodynia, which is light touch, which causes pain, there's a 30 to one odds ratio that that type of pain is connected to central pain mechanisms. If they've had pain for longer than 12 to 16 weeks, again, there's a 27 to one odds ratio. And if you go back to your statistics, a one to one odds ratio is considered st uh, statistically significant. So these are factors that are highly correlated with central pain mechanisms. If they have diffuse pain, if the pain is starting to spread, if it's starting to, um, you know, they, they started with left pelvic pain and now they have right pelvic pain, um, again, secondary to mirror neurons or changes in the nervous system, there's a 15 to one odds ratio. And psychosocial distress, such as fear avoidance and catastrophization are also correlated with the sensitive nervous system so that there's a seven to one odds ratio. So when you're listening to their story and really taking time to hear their history, you're starting to get those first cues that hmm, there may be central sensitization at play here. But can we do better than that? Can we actually start to measure central sensitization more objectively in the clinic? And so what I have started to use over the last maybe uh, five years or so is the CSI or the central sensitization inventory, which is a very helpful tool for identifying patients who have a sensitive nervous system. There's two parts to the questionnaire. The first part is a series of 25 questions. The questions are scored on a Likert scale from zero to four. And um, you just add up all the values of the 25 questions. And if they score greater than 40, Neblet has shown in his research that they have central sensitization that correlates with central sensitization. They could have a score of less than 40, but if part B, which is a series of conditions that have been correlated thoroughly in the research to be connected to central sensitization, like fibromyalgia, like IBS, and again, you can read through the list here. Um, they, if they have one of these conditions, they also have a sensitive nervous system or central sensitization, okay? Now, if we look at those conditions, Clifford Wolf um, is a physician researcher who has spent the last 30 to 35 years researching central sensitization. And here are all the conditions that he has been able to demonstrate through research are connected to central sensitization. And I've highlighted in red the conditions that are pelvic pain conditions. And almost every single pelvic pain condition that we see as clinicians is connected, according to the research, to a sensitized nervous system. So what do we do with that? So if they're centrally sensitized, how does that impact our care? So first of all, central sensitization can be recognized by screening for disproportionate pain. So Keith Smart's uh, phenotypes that he talked about, and then using a pain drawing and using the central sensitization inventory questionnaire. So we've talked about that. If central sensitization is present, it predicts poor outcome following classical local tissue-based treatments such as electrotherapy, manual therapy, motor control exercises, and surgery. So if someone is sensitized, this is a patient population that we need to move out of the tissues and start to look at them from a more broad perspective. And the broad perspective will include um, addressing lifestyle factors that sustain the process of central sensitization, including illness beliefs, stress, sleep, physical activity, and diet. So what happens, and we're gonna use bladder pain syndrome in this talk as just an example. And bladder pain syndrome, again, has been correlated with central sensitization. So as clinicians, we may start to educate our patients about the nervous system being very similar to an alarm system. And that after the initial insult or injury, instead of calming down as the alarm system should, the alarm system has stayed extra sensitive. So we'll do some pain education, some pain biology education with our patients. We teach them how pain is an output of the brain, not an input from tissues. But here's where internationally, most of us get hung up. We talk about pain, and then we go and treat the tissues. 
We do manual therapy, trigger point release. We might do installation therapy for bladder pain. We might do surgery for bladder pain. So again, we get hooked into those local um, treatments of the tissues themselves. And does that fit with where the research has taken us? So Bronnie Thompson is a PhD occupational therapist in, in New Zealand who has put forth this framework based on the research. And I always like to point this out and say that when we look at the experience of pain, nociception or danger messages from the tissue only partially um, uh, are, are partially correlated with the pain experience or are responsible for the pain experience. Our behavior is partially responsible, but then start to look at some of those bigger sort of bubbles. Our thoughts and beliefs are hugely responsible. Our emotions, so pain is a sensory and emotional experience and the context or the story that we tell ourselves or the context of our lives that we find ourselves in, including highly stressful situations, for example, or adverse childhood experience and trauma, those things have more to do with the um, production of persistent pain than nociception. And yet we spend a lot of our time looking for nociceptive drivers. So it takes courage to change. It's difficult to change. We've all been tr trained very biomedically. We are all very skilled clinicians in assessing and treating the tissues. And so we're very comfortable staying here. We're all unique. So first of all, there are many different professionals who, who treat persistent pelvic pain, physicians, sexologists, physiotherapists, nurses. We've all been trained differently. Um, with even, even within each profession, um, every professional, so physiotherapists are all individually treating a little bit differently. And our patients present very uniquely. So we have all these complexities that we need to think about. And what the research is asking us is, can we at least agree on a framework? And that's what I wanna talk about for the rest of this lecture. The stark reality of not changing our framework from a biomedical framework to a biopsychosocial framework is, is extreme difficulty. Opioid crisis, chronic pain, suicide ideation. So what we know about bladder pain syndrome is that um, patients who struggle with bladder pain and interstitial cystitis, about 25% of those women have suicidal ideation. That's higher than the number of women um, or men who are on an inpatient psychiatric floor at the hospital. So there's significant um, psychosocial distress that happens and consequences. And so our patients are really asking us to look at our framework and think about changing that framework. So the framework I'm gonna propose is one proposed by Dr. Sajid, and he is a physician that actually wrote this framework for primary care physicians with regards to idiopathic low back pain. And idiopathic low back pain is another hallmark condition of central sensitization. So what I wanna do is I wanna take this framework and apply it to pelvic pain particularly bladder pain syndrome. And what we're gonna see in this approach is not only does it apply to physicians, but it actually also applies to physiotherapists and to nurses um, as we look at the broader research in all of our specific areas of expertise. So what Sajid, uh, Dr. Sajid recommends is we use the relief mnemonic. So we wanna rule out red flags, educate about pain early, use less imaging, less intervention, introduce goals early on, we want to look at exercise and movement, and we want to look at our pharmacology. So the first job is to rule out red flags. This is a biopsychosocial approach. We cannot forget the bio piece. Just because someone has central sensitization as measured by the CSI, either part A or part B, doesn't mean that they don't need a thorough physical exam and the tissues need to be assessed and treated appropriately. So that's the first thing that we must all do. And whether that's medically or also physically, mechanically from a physiotherapist perspective, first do a good physical exam. 
The second thing that we want to do is we want to start to educate our patients about pain early on. So we don't want to go to pain education as a default strategy when treating the tissues didn't work. But when we identify central sensitization, we want to start with pain education. Now, this is a wonderful three or four minute uh, clip that you can find on YouTube. It's called Tame the Beast. You can find it at tamethebeast.org. It was put together by Dr. Uh, Lorna Mosley, a professor and pain scientist in Adelaide. And he has done a wonderful job of really um, translating this knowledge into clinical practice. And I would highly suggest you take a look at this video and maybe you start to use it in your clinical practice to start educating your patients about pain. Now the goal of pain education is to be very clear with your patient that it is not in their head. They are not just thinking about this wrong. Their pain is real, it is exactly what they say it is, but that their nervous system has gotten too good at protecting them. So again, it's a structural problem, but the structure is in the nervous system changes that happen, not in the tissue changes per se, or at least not solely in the tissue changes. Step three for Dr. Sajid is to say, we need to do less imaging, less testing. We know in many different areas of medicine that there is a lot of pain, pain-free pathology um, out, out there. We know this in low back pain, we know this in hip pain, and what we do know about low back and hip pain is that they're highly correlated with pelvic pain, and that's why I put these statistics here. So we see um, a lot of pathological changes that are completely asymptomatic. We also see this in bladder pain syndrome. When we do hydrodistension, we will see glomulations or bleeding points in the bladder wall, and we also have a lot of research that says that that also happens in, in women without bladder problems or without bladder pain. So again, we can't hang our hat on that pathology. We've seen a similar picture in endometriosis, not to just focus on bladder pain. We know that the severity of pain does not correlate well with the severity of the condition, and therefore severe disease may go undiagnosed, and minimal disease may be overtreated surgically. So again, a lot of pain, let's go in surgically to see what happens, and there's minimal to no disease. As part of this less imaging, Dr. Sajid also suggests that we use less interventions as well. So he calls this um, complicit or gesture medicine. We do techniques, surgical techniques, manual therapy techniques like you know releasing pelvic floor muscles to actually um, you know give a gesture of trying to help our patients. So again, with the best intentions, but that can actually have a very negative impact on the patient trying to get better because it focuses them on tissue health versus on the sensitive nervous system. So it's important to recognize that. He also says we have to be really careful that we do not give negative prognoses, that we actually, based on central sensitization, give them the hope that their nervous system can change. Because otherwise, um, if we just say to them, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, you're going to have to learn to live with this, then they become hopeless. And the conservative therapies, which can really help, um, may not be as effective because of um, the, the language that we use with our patients. So what do we do instead? If that's what we don't want to do, how do we treat bladder pain syndrome or patients with a sensitive nervous system? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to then profile or phenotype the characteristics of the patient's nervous system in front of us. And the best way that I know how to do that is to use objective measures of distress, which are the DAS-21 um, scale, depression, anxiety, and stress assessment, assessing for catastrophization through the pain catastrophizing questionnaire, looking at pain self-efficacy, a very strong predictor of, of who is going to stay in a chronic pain state is how um, confident are they that they can continue with life? So again, looking at that um, very carefully can help you plan your treatment more appropriately. Looking for injustice, looking for fear, looking for low positive affect, looking at the correlation between adverse childhood events and persistent adult pain and giving patients the opportunity to talk about their adverse childhood events um, has been shown in the research to actually have a very positive effect 
on their nervous system. And then sleep. Sleep is a very important thing to objectively measure and then to treat um, as part of your target. Here's a very busy slide. I'm just going to highlight a few things, but this is how I approach um, profiling a sensitive nervous system. So I start with the CSI. And then I do all of these questionnaires with every single one of my patients. I don't pick and choose and decide who gets what. I try and be very unbiased in the process. And if someone is presenting with pain, bladder pain and self-reported depression, um, we're gonna look at cardiovascular exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, yoga therapy, resistance training. All of those have good evidence in helping depression and therefore helping pain. In stress, I might look more specifically at helping my patient to develop a practice that helps them to evoke the relaxation response. So yoga, meditation, tai chi, qigong, prayer, any of those have been shown again in the research to be very helpful to mitigate the stress response. And in fear, for example, I might use graded exposure, I might use a fear ladder or cognitive functional therapy, for example, to address the fear. So it's, I always like to say, for example, meditation has gained in popularity in treating the sensitive nervous system, and meditation can be very helpful. I find it helpful for patients who are high ruminators, for example, or very hypervigilant. But if we give meditation to everyone who has persistent pain, and really fear is their sort of phenotypic characteristic presentation, we actually need to expose them to their fears and do more of a graded exposure program. So we need to be more targeted, I think, than what we typically have. The fourth step in his framework is to introduce goals. And again, introduce goals early on. The focus is on function. And the question could go something like this. If you woke up tomorrow without pain, what would your day look like? What would you be doing more of? And then setting that goal and starting to do a graded sort of approach towards that goal. The other thing that we need to change functionally is maybe some lifestyle factors that are contributing to the sensitivity of their nervous system. So how well are they eating? Are they eating a diet of whole food? Are they eating a lot of junk food? Um, are they eating a lot of processed food? Exercise, we're going to talk about in just a moment. Tobacco and alcohol, both um, contribute to a sensitive nervous system. Stress management, we've talked about a little bit. Sleep is such an important component, and there's good evidence behind CBT insomnia, for example, that we should be using with our patients. And then healthy relationships, connections, developing strong social connections is very um, good for our nervous systems. Step five is exercise and movement. And we all need to participate in prescribing exercise and movement to our patients. Uh, Dr. Eccleston won the prestigious Ron Melzack Award at the International Association for the Study of Pain Conference in 2018. And in his, in his keynote address, he said, the time has come where all medical professionals who deal with the body, so doctors, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, um, sports medicine, anybody who deals with the body needs to incorporate the psychological components when treating pain. And anybody who is a psychologist, a social worker who focuses on the mental health component needs to incorporate an, the embodied experience of pain and also look at the physicality. It is always a biopsychosocial perspective. You know, walking is walking. And we know that um, uh, Dr. Mike Evans in Canada here in Toronto has done a lovely YouTube uh, video clip called 23 and a half hours, where he makes the point that if physicians could only prescribe one thing moving forward, what do we have the most evidence behind? And that is clearly walking. We need to get our patients moving. We need to hit the World Health Organization target of 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. We need to start slowly and build up. We don't have to do it all at once. Resistance training also can be very helpful with persistent pain. And again, World Health Organization guidelines two times a week. We also need to have a balanced exercise diet of working in and working out. And in many Western cultures, exercise is cardiovascular and weight training, where we miss what the Eastern cultures do much better um, at than we do. And that is having a regular practice of evoking the relaxation response. What we don't know in the research yet is what's the frequency needed of working in, but I try it for my patients to create a balance between working out and working in. 
Remember that the brain's medicine is better than opioids. We call this a wet brain. The brain has the most powerful drug cabinet in the world. Endorphins get released when we exercise. And when that flushes down the spinal cord, it reduces the incoming danger messages and decreases pain. So relaxation exercises and walking produce a wet brain. And that is our goal with our patients. This isn't new. Um, Hippocrates in, in the fifth and fourth centuries before Christ said that all parts of the body which have a function, if used in moderation and exercised in labors in which each, each is accustomed, become thereby healthy, well-developed, and age more slowly. But if unused and left idle, they become liable to disease, defective in growth, and age quickly. So this is not new medicine. This is not new age. This has been around for centuries. Dr. Sajin's last step is looking at pharmacology. I'm a physiotherapist, and so I'm not going to comment too much on this, except that there is a role for pharmacology, but he gives some very specific guidelines around what type of pharmacology for persistent pain. And so again, I would encourage you to read his paper on that. To summarize, what we need to do to treat persistent pain that is involved with central sensitization, so bladder pain syndrome, for example, is we have to get out of the tissues. It doesn't mean that we never address tissue problems. It's part of the picture, but it's only a small part of the picture. What we need to do is take a much broader framework. We need to assess the psychosocial components objectively, we need to address them to desensitize the nervous system, and then we need to increase function and restore healthy lifestyle um, changes with our patients. What it does not involve is just looking for tissues to fix and repair. That is not the solution for persistent pain, and bladder pain syndrome is no different. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, please let me know if you have any questions.